Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective, and today we've got a lot to talk about. So this beautiful machine was donated by Chemish, and this is a ThinkPad T60P. Now, it's got a real stiff hinge, which was one of the things it was known for, um, but there is a lot to really go over um, with regards to this. So uh, just a couple quick things before we get into it. The ThinkPad T60 was released in February of 2006, and it was made until December of 2007. It was the first T60 era series machine, and it would be replaced by the T61. Now, this is the first T series that Lenovo was actually producing under their own steam. Lenovo was contracted out prior to this to produce several machines. However, this was after the acquisition of the brand. So this is why on this particular model, you will see that it says Lenovo on the inside of the case. The branding on uh, here matches what David Hill was talking about when I interviewed him uh, regarding that. And you can view that video over here. But you will also notice that it has IBM on the lid. And this is very common for this era to see these parts mixed and matched in this sort of thing, uh, just because of how the branding was being handed over. And again, check out that video if you want to know more about that. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about the acquisition of IBM's uh, ThinkPad division by Lenovo, there's two resources I suggest you check out. One, of course, is the book by Steve Hamm, The Race for Perfect, Inside the Quest to Design the Ultimate Portable Computer. He talks about a lot of different things, a general history of laptops and portable computers. He talks a lot about the X300, which was the first real flagship machine that Lenovo designed. And I did an entire project uh, video series on that called Project Kodachi, which you can view over here. And really highly recommend you check that out. This thing is crazy. It is what essentially would become the X1 and X1 Carbon series. Again, really should check that series out. Awesome, lots of interview clips. And then if you want to know more about Steve Hamm, I've also had the opportunity to speak with him as well. So if you want to know more about that, I'll leave a link over here. And all of the links to all this other stuff will be in the description down. Let's change our focus to the T60. So. Two variants were made, the T60 and the T60P, which you see here in front of you. The T60P was essentially the top shelf uh, version. It had a whole bunch of really intense uh, things going on in there. You could get it in the T60 series. Uh, the really unique things would be the screen and the graphics cards, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the T60 brought a lot of new things uh, to the ThinkPad lineup. It would bring things like the AlterNav button configuration that we see here. It would bring uh, SATA hard drives and the Windows key to the keyboard. Now beyond the two major variants, there were three screen sizes available, a 14 inch, a 15 inch, uh, which were both in four by three, and then a 15.4 inch widescreen 16 by 10, which is actually this beautiful panel here. Now the T60 had uh, all three of the panels available. It had a 14.1 inch uh, four by three, and I'll list the resolutions up on the screen. It had a 15 inch four by three, and then it had a 15.4 inch uh, 16 by 10. The T60P is unique in the sense that it has a 15.4 inch 1920 by 1200 16 by 10 panel. And that was only on the P variant. CPUs, there's a huge list here. And here's what you really need to know. You have essentially Intel Core and Intel uh, Core Duo and Intel Core 2 Duo. Uh, and I'll just list them all up on the screen for your reference. Now, this is a socketed CPU, so other CPUs can go in there. Uh, the most compatibility you're gonna get is if you have a Revision 3 motherboard, and you can use CPU Z uh, to find that out. GPUs would depend entirely on the uh, size of the chassis and the CPU, uh, but essentially what you're looking at is the Intel Graphics Media Accelerator 950, or the ATI X1300, 1400, or VS uh, series of GPUs. Now, when we're talking about the T60P, you have the choice of the ATI Mobility Fire GL V5200 or V5250. Now, these are essentially rebranded um, X series cards like you would get on the normal T60, at least that's what I've read online. 
um, but they are still better than what you would get in the standard T60. RAM was four gigabytes, two sticks of two. Uh, however, it is in most instances throttled to three gigabytes. There may be aftermarket BIOSes that you can install to get the full four gigs, but there is a, a, a lot of stuff to get in your way there. So with that being said, let's just do a quick tour of some ports and features. Now this one's pretty much fully spec'd out and we know that because it has the extra goodies like Bluetooth, it has the fingerprint reader and the palm rest. Uh, these weren't coming with uh, web cameras. Uh, they had a think light up at the top as you would expect from a ThinkPad of this era. You had some upward firing speakers. You had the ultranav set up with the buttons on the palm rest and then your dedicated buttons for track point including middle mouse. Closing the machine, the display latches kick in and work uh, very nicely. We do have indicators for sleep, charge, and battery. And now onto the ports. On the left-hand side, we've got VGA, 56K modem, Ethernet, and dedicated microphone and headphone jacks. We have USB 2.0, and we have a card bus type 2 slot, as well as an express card 54 millimeter in this tray right here. So a little bit of future, a little bit of legacy support. Along the front, we do have the IR blaster for communicating files between uh, devices that also have the IR blaster. We have the physical Wi-Fi kill switch, of course. We would have a uh, card reader slot. However, uh, this one seems to be currently unoccupied, but the punch out is missing. Along the back, we have the power plug, standard barrel. And then over here, we've got an additional uh, USB, uh, two USB 2.0 ports, and then we have the Ultra Bay Slim. And of course, the Ultra Bay Slim is hot swappable, so we just pull that and out it comes. And then this is the DVD Multi, and you could also get the, uh, a DVD ROM, a CDRW DVD or ROM, and then the uh, Super Multi Burner, um, which I believe this might also be a revision of that. And with all of that reassembled, let's turn this thing over and talk a little bit about what we see on the bottom as well. We do have a docking connector, which will support the advanced dock, the advanced mini dock, and then the essential port replicator. Batteries came in a variety of different configurations. This one here, uh, the battery catch has been unfortunately damaged and will require a tool to remove, which is why we're leaving it for disassembly. So disassembly is pretty standard if you've ever opened up ThinkPad before. This extended battery is the 85 watt hour option. And once that is out of the way, uh, you're noticing that there's not a whole lot of uh, bays and doors for us to open. So we'll just move over here and remove the screw for the hard disk drive bay. And I believe that this has actually been upgraded because it is SATA uh, to give us something a little bit speedier. So in that case, we've got a Kingston 128 gigabyte SSD. And there are some screws missing on the bottom of this. So we would normally go through and remove all of them, but that has, <laughs> some of them have been removed already for us. But our main focus is on the pictograms that either show the keyboard, the palm rest, uh, or the other components that we're gonna wanna remove from the top. Because everything that we want is gonna be accessible through there. With the remaining screws that were in there removed, we're gonna open this guy up. And removing the palm rest is pretty trivial. We go in here, pull this out, and we've got the whole assembly for the trackpad. And then we see the expansion cable that goes over to the module for the fingerprint reader. And that's all handled through this one cable. So a retrofit is a bit more involved. You're pretty much replacing every component on the bottom of the uh, palm rest. Keyboard is pretty easy. You just kind of wiggle it free. And it looks like this is gonna be a move off to the left. And there we go, keyboard is free. And on the inside, we have uh, pretty much the remaining pieces that we would want to service or upgrade. We do have our two uh, sticks of RAM here. So we've got uh, two 
uh, one gigabyte sticks uh, for a total of two. So that is uh, well on your way, 67% on what was officially supported. You do have a CMOS battery. We do have our Wi-Fi card and all of the antennas there. That should be our 56K modem card, I suspect, or it might be Bluetooth, one of the two. It's probably written on here on the FRU somewhere. And then, of course, we have the whole uh, heat sink assembly that we can remove, and if we wanted to swap out the CPU, that's exactly how we would do it. Uh, to get better access, of course, we would need to finish off by removing the rest of the trim piece here. But that's pretty much it. Like, you can see that this is... Uh, Probably better built on the inside than it was the outside because like this roll cage uh, is in all of the right places, very durable. Uh, the plastics, not so much. They were still working on that. So you can kind of see that this one's got some battle damage, especially on the screen bezels. But hey, uh, this machine probably didn't live a very cushy life. It was owned by a company. There's some stickers on the bottom to prove that. Uh, but overall, it's a pretty pretty good first effort, and these machines are kind of well-loved. If we're looking for a retro machine that is kind of enjoyed in terms of modding as much as like the T430 is, it's probably the T60, and uh, it's pretty easy to see why. Very easy to work on, uh, some very super durable components, really cool. So let's put all of this back together, uh, turn this machine on, and uh, we might do some gaming on it. So... Just give me one moment. All right, let's power this thing on. And yes, this is uh, running Windows 10, which is definitely not native to this machine. Be more of a Windows XP era device, but yeah, you just always want to see what these things can do, right? And that's not too shabby. All right, to have a little bit of fun, I thought we would try out a 3D game. And this, of course, is Emperor Battle for Dune, as you can read. And this was like one of the last games that Westwood kind of made before they were completely swallowed up by EA. And while the system requirements, the minimum system requirements are quite low, I remember playing this on a computer that should have been able to play it back in the day, and it ran like a pig. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what 256 megabytes of uh, dedicated video memory uh, will do in terms of performance. Let's go ahead and get this on that drive and see how it performs. All right, so let's talk about the hell that this was. Um, <laughs> we had a bit of an issue where there were several problems. Uh, so in the original testing, it was using a generic driver, so it wasn't using the ATI driver at all. After about four hours of on and off troubleshooting, I was able to find a driver that seemed to play nice and then that created a transparency issue in Windows 10 because it just didn't understand transparency in Windows. So that made a lot of the menus and stuff pretty unusable. So I went into the registry, disabled that so Windows would behave normally, and I got really good performance out of Doom 3, uh, which was interesting. Watch for worm sign as your units cross the sand, Commander. Let's go. So Doom 3 was playing nice. No issues there uh, at all. Uh, however, I would launch Emperor Battle for Dune. I would launch uh, Call of Duty 1. And neither one of them would work correctly. Uh, they just uh, had different artifacting, glitches, you name it. So the only way that I could... I uh, think to get around that was to use uh, DG Voodoo and just run the entire thing in a container and then drop the settings down to about medium. Now, it'll look like this thing is chugging, but it's just reading from the CD. That, the game always kind of done that. 
The moral of the story is, is that if you're going to use a T60 um, for anything graphically intensive, uh, no matter what you do, um, do not install Windows 10 like I did. Because uh, you will be in for a grand old time of just fights. Uh, and hey, if you're into that sort of thing and you want to maybe figure out a better way of doing this than I have, then by all means, please do, and uh, let me know in the comments section how successful you were. And I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek. I actually want to know if you're actually able to do this better than I was able to. Uh, but this seems to be uh, very playable now. Um, but like I said, Doom 3 was working just fine. Call of Duty 1 wasn't. Probably too old. I suspect I need to use DG Voodoo with that as well. Bit of a learning curve, lots to figure out. So overall, ladies and gentlemen, I think that the T60, unless you are going to be running a Linux distribution, um, is teetering very much the line of a retro machine, simply because of all of the stuff that you have to do to get it running a modern operating system, at least what I had to do. I suspect that there are other people out there that are going to have way more luck than I did with just getting one of these things set up but my experience is my experience. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at this uh, beautiful laptop. Thanks to Chemish for donating it to the channel. Great specimen. And if you do have stories, and I know there will be a lot about the T60 or T60P, make sure you're firing them down into that comment section. And if you did enjoy the video, then make sure that you're doing all the YouTube stuff that helps the channel grow over there as well. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next time.